Apostates Anonymous, the show you turn to when you're no longer an evangelical, with your hosts, hosts, authors Keith Giles and Matthew J. DiStefano. Well, 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 we've made it to episode episode two of the rebranding. Exactly. And they said it wouldn't last. They said it wouldn't last. These fucking people. <laughs> oh, Don't yeah. you dare doubt us. Never. Never we're, doubt us. We're rolling now. Well, we have a, um, we have a fun episode today, I think. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of cut and paste. We're going to be hearing from uh, someone who is vehemently anti-deconstruction. Elisa mm-hmm. Childers, we've commented on her before. You've made me watch extensively lengthy yes. um, YouTube videos of hers, and um, this one we have a sh- we have short one today. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> you know she um, she really is the um, the greatest authority on deconstruction. That's really why I watch her videos because I, I want to learn so much about deconstruction, and and really she seems to know things about it that I really don't know, uh, even though I've been deconstructing for a long time. Uh, but yeah, she. She's the expert, apparently, and um, we know. So this this is how I think of it. Like, so right now we're in the midst of a pandemic. We should be listening to infectious disease experts, PhD mm. level researchers. She's the equivalent of someone who took biology freshman year. You know, <laughs> right. so she was like a quote unquote progressive Christian for forty five seconds of her life, and now it seems that her entire shtick or mo, if you yeah. don't want to use a pejorative, um, yeah. is to comment on that which she has very little um, uh, uh, expertise of. Right. And so actually I was thinking about this the other day, and I don't don't think we've talked about this already before on this, at least on this podcast, but here's what, as I understand it anyway, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but as I understand her testimony, um, so she says, I was a progressive Christian, and that's why I have this experience, this wisdom, right? Because of my experience as a progressive Christian. However, she never actually was a progressive Christian. If I understand her testimony correctly, she joined a church that she thought was a conservative church. So she thought she was part of a church that was a conservative church and then found out to her horror that the pastor of that church had some views that were progressive and that scared her and then she left. So that would be like saying if I joined a church that I thought was a, was a progressive church and it turned out to be a Mormon church, and then later I wrote a book about my, my time as a Mormon. As a Mormon. <laughs> a memoir. <laughs> my memoir. My, my six months as a Mormon. Yeah. Because, because I was accidentally. <laughs> it's called Accidental Mormon. Accidental there's Mormon, your, there's, yes. There's your title. Yeah, so, so if anything, there you go. She's an, she was an accidental progressive. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, never embraced those views ever. Right. Which makes yeah. a whole world of difference because now, I mean, if I think about my own story, I was an evangelical. Right. I may not have embraced wholeheartedly the beliefs. I may have like bristled at the at various ideas, but had to accept them anyway. Right. For 25 yeah. years. So that's exactly. a big difference. Between, and, and the people who are older a lot uh, have, you know, been evangelicals a lot longer than that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 25 years, six months. I mean, yeah. it's. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to get into a, um, well, the episode won't be lengthy, or will be lengthy, but the clips are, you know, I tried to break them up in a couple minutes each. We'll hit the pause on that, and then we will comment, kind of like a reaction video on YouTube, except without video. That's right. And now we, this- have, we have faces for radio. I was in a band called Face for Radio once. Oh, that's great. Yes. The- yeah. <laughs> Shameless plug of a band I was in 25 years ago. <laughs> faces for Radio. Yeah, that's great. Um so now this is a uh, this is a what's the title of this Alyssa Childers video that we are going to uh, we are going to examine? How the fuck to? am I supposed to remember? Oh, I, th- I don't it? know. I thought you I had it. it. I ha- well, I have it already in my in my recording program. Oh, I see. Program. I see. Okay, Here, I you see. sent it to me recently. Um, uh, how do you determine what is true according to progressive Christianity? There you go. Okay. Yo, this is great. Oh, this is, yeah, I remember it now. Yeah. It's coming back to me. Yes. It's all coming so, back to me now. So this is a reaction to Alyssa Childers' video, How Do You yeah. Determine What is True According to Progressive Christians? So now she is, is. going to tell us how tell we as progressives 
What you believe. Understand truth and yes, and how we arrive at truth. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, Well, before this though. (laughs) Okay. I have an announcement. Yeah. We have another sponsor today. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So we're going to hear from them right now. Are you a deconstructing Christian in search of some serious street cred? Have a desire to sin, but not sure if it's right for you? Well, now you're in luck. At the Backsliders Coalition, we have a variety of services that can be tailored to you. Want to cheat on your spouse? We have guidance counselors standing by. Have an urge to light up a joint? We have hundreds of products that can be shipped discreetly to your home. But wait, there's more. If you sign up today and use the promo code STREETCRED, you'll save 66.6% off our exclusive Street Cred Apostates Pack. Check out tbc.heretic.com for more details. All right. Now that all we right. got now that we got the monies out of the way, the um oh. yeah, the the all the money we you know, we got to pay for the show. You so got to pay the bill. Have high quality pay. sponsors, so go check them out. Yeah, I'm just and so now glad we, we have sponsors. That yeah. uh, makes all the difference. I put in a lot of work to gather up some of these household names across the country. I appreciate that. Thank you. Companies that we can agree with that kind of resonate with the vibe of the show. So Yes. Yes. Um we can get into Miss Elisa Childers now. I wait. I said that entirely wrong. <laughs> That's what Oh yeah, said. don't don't say it like that. <laughs> that was a total Freudian. I want to read through this doctrinal statement from this church. Um because again, I said this before. I really it's my goal, it's my heart to pr- present to you these ideas accurately. What I don't want to do is build a straw man. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, it's a it's a logical fallacy where you essentially construct a much weaker version of your uh, you know, ideological opponent's view because it's much easier to kick a straw man down or a scarecrow down in a cornfield than it is to kick a real man down. So I don't want to do that. I want to present the progressive Christian views as accurately as possible. So this is the belief statement from this progressive church. And again, I'm doing this because I think that we are going to see a lot more of these churches pop up. So this church started evangelical many years ago, kind of started a slow and subtle shift toward progressive Christianity and uh, and is now self-identified as a progressive Christian church. So this isn't a pejorative, this isn't um, a derogatory term to call someone a progressive Christian. This is how they identify themselves. And so this is their belief uh, statement. So our beliefs, it says, at our core, we hold to these principles with open hands and humility. Okay. Wow. So it sounds like a nice place, actually. It starts off great, doesn't it? I mean, and I'll be honest, when I first heard the beginning, I was like, well, okay, good. You know, she's responding to some of the criticism. I'm sure not specifically us, because I don't think she really listens to us. But we are we are nobody, Keith. We're no we're no one to her. But um, but hey, that's great. You know what? I'm so relieved that she wants, as she says, to present these ideas accurately. She does not want to set up a straw man, uh, and she wants to present as accurately as possible things that progressives actually believe. So that sounds great. I love um. <laughs> this is not about the content, but it, like it's just like it's a podcaster thing. It'll be like, and I just want to, I just want to present something. This is something that I've been thinking about for a while, and we've talked about it before on the show uh-huh. uh, on one of those episodes in the past. And you know, I was kicking around the ideas with my brother, and he made some good points. And it's this, and, be- and before I say it, I just wanted to, and, and it's like just yeah, that's <laughs> just- the fucking point. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a total podcast thing. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. So yeah. um, the, the church sounds lovely. They're going to open uh, open hands and humility, and yeah. And, and I'm not going to. I I actually commented. I was baited again uh, to comment on this YouTube video. So my comments are probably there. Yeah, mine are. Well, I don't. I did too. I don't know if they are still there. They but, might not be. It's yeah. been a couple of weeks. I haven't checked. But I, I basically said like it's kind of like that. Alyssa Childers. I'm not going to present a straw man, and then goes on to present a straw man. Yeah. Um, and someone was like, can you share one of them? And I was like, well, I'm going to talk about it on a show that I have. I wasn't like trying to promote the show, but like, I kind of feel like, you know, I didn't want to go through and point them out. It's kind of like, if you don't, if you don't know, then you aren't living in the world to know why that's a straw man, you know? So, right. But I did, I eventually shared one and uh, we'll get to it shortly here. 
Yes. Should we should we move on to the next? I don't really have much to say about that so far. It's kind of just the setup. Oh yeah, it is the setup. And um, I, by the way, just as you were talking, I went ahead and jumped over to the video, and my comments are still there. Uh, I don't know if yours are. Oh no, yours are there too. So actually, yes. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, that's that's something. They're not to, erased. To, to her credit, yes, she's leaving um, our heretical uh, comments right there. So thank yeah. you, thank you, Elisa, thank, for thank doing you. that. Okay, you might not thank us after the next section. <laughs> that's right. So number one is God is a mystery to be explored, not a doctrine to be espoused. God is a mystery to be explored, not a doctrine to be espoused. So in my experience, progressive Christians are typically not creedal in the sense that they're united around a, a, like a, a a core set of beliefs that you you have to believe these things uh, to consider yourself a progressive Christian. And so I think that's why they're saying it's not a doctrine to be espoused. Now, I just have to take a logical look at this because I always have to do this. But when you say God is a mystery to be explored, not a doctrine to be espoused, that statement itself is a doctrine. That is a doctrine about God. And so it sort of refutes itself because essentially just by saying it, you're espousing a doctrine about God. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of make that point. But I see this a lot in progressive Christianity. God is a mystery to be explored. And so um, I think that when you present God as a mystery, like this mysterious figure that we can't quite, you know, we, we, we can't pin him down. We're not going to make uh, dogmatic statements about who he is. We're not going to make dogmatic statements about his nature and his character. He's a mystery to be explored. It's more about the journey than the destination. You know, some people have that phrase that they'll say. Um, I think what this does, and this is why I think progressive Christianity is dangerous. I think this is why uh, it is a threat. I know as I'm using strong words, but that's a th it's a threat to the real gospel because the real gospel has certain points in it, certain things it says about God, certain things it says about humans, that if it's true uh, and we reject it, our eternal souls, uh, ha there are consequences for our eternal souls. Uh, th that is according to the historic Christian gospel. Wow. Okay, now we're into it, baby. Now we're in so much. <laughs> okay. There's so much there. I I kept rechecking myself. Should I pause it? Damn it. No, I've already got it set up for this. Right. Okay, so as I understand the flow of what she said, so first of all, she read the statement, which I like, God is a mystery to be explained, not a doctrine to be espoused. I think she's correct that a lot of progressives, progressive Christians are not creedal Christians. That's not a course across the board. Many progressives are creedal Christians. Sure. But um, but apparently the one she's reading uh, probably wouldn't fall in that camp. Right. And, um, and I mean, she could technically be correct that that itself is a doctrinal statement, the mystery of God. Yeah. However, I think... She says it's self-refuting, but I don't I don't think it's so much like a logical statement, but rather a posture. Yeah. And doctrine is also often associated with rigidity and dogmatism. Yes. And so it's not that progressives, even probably in this church, I have no idea what church she's speaking of, but let's yeah. just say generally, they would believe in doctrines, but again, it's through the context of holding it loosely with humility. Yeah. So it can be doctrinal, but not dogmatic. And I think that's the point of of saying like God is a mystery, not a doctrine. Well, yeah, in itself, that is a mis that is a doctrinal statement, but it's it's with the you go again. It's with the context of it's not dogmatic. Thank you, thank you. That's a great point, Matt, and I think that is um yeah. So and it's funny because I'm writing my my next book is going to be on this whole topic of God as a mystery and exploring mystery and embracing mystery and things like that when it comes to God. So uh, this this topic is really fascinating to me and. I mean, I, I would agree with that statement. I do think that God is a, is a mystery uh, is a mystery to be explored, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so that that in itself, first of all, if you notice, she doesn't uh, address that statement. She just seems to kind of brush it aside because number one, it, that's a doctrinal statement in itself; it's self refuting. And number two, she jumps straight into which we're going to get into in it next um, this the quote unquote the dangers uh, of progressive. Christianity right. and why it's a threat and all that. But, yeah. um, but I mean, just, I, I guess what I would, I would love to have a conversation with Alyssa Childers, just like about that topic, like true or false, God is a mystery. In other words, do you believe that your theology has figured God out? You have, you defined God. Do you have God in a book or a box? 
Um, do you, are you telling me you can explain and you understand this creator, uh, who has existed, you know, for eternity, created everything with a breath and with a word, um, and, uh, you know, holds the universe together in some strange way. You, can you explain that being to me? Cause I'd love you. Cause if, if that's not mysterious, admit- <laughs> not, if that's not mysterious, nothing is. Yeah. So tell me. You know, how could you disagree with that statement that God is a mystery to be explored? And I think it's actually, as you said, it's a posture. It's um, it's an approach to God that I find much more healthy and accurate and reasonable to say we're going to talk about a, a topic and a being that, by definition, um, transcends all human understanding and knowledge and information. And so we would have to come to it, as you said, with some amount of humility. Well, and this is this is what's a kind of a misnomer. Well, first, I want to say that we're we're doing this sort of thing so that the true actual arguments can be presented because this this is, I think, a, like a perpetual straw man. But yeah, um, and and and, and it's kind of uh, you know, it's not it's not we're not trying to like drag Childers' name through the mud. Just trying to have the debate that we would like to have if people like like her would be willing. Yes, and to say the things that we would say. I would say that even progressive Christian, it's kind of a misnomer on a lot of things. Like what she's talking about, the mystery of God here is not a progressive Christian thing. It's it's in the mystics of all traditions going back to the Buddha, which thousands of years before Jesus or yeah. hundreds of years before Jesus, eight, 100. 800 years, Yeah, 800 years, nearly a thousand years before Jesus, the mystery of God in, in Baha'i. We just talked to Rain Wilson on, on Her- you know, Heretic Happy Hour, like... They talk about, I know that's a modern, a more modern faith, but it's going to the traditions of people, yeah. ancients. Yeah. And it's to approach God as a mystery and to, because the minute you don't is the minute you box God in. Yep. And, and this is, this is not a progressive thing per se. This goes back to Rumi. This goes back to St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, yeah. I mean, and then continuing in that tradition, Richard Rohr, who are, you know, Yep. Well established Catholics. David Bentley Hart, I would say, approaches God oh, yeah. in a more mysterious way, who's an Eastern Orthodox, the true Orthodox, yeah. quote unquote, historic Christianity, as Alyssa likes to say. Yes, I know. And see this again. Now, now we're getting into the, the territory, as you said. Like, so right when she turns the corner there about, well, this is, and, I, and again, being fair to her, I, you and I used to hold her belief. So I totally get why she feels that this is a dangerous way to talk about God because there, in her mind, there are some beliefs that she says, if uh, these doctrines are basically her doctrines, if her doctrines about God are true, and she does clarify it that way, then to be wrong about those things about God means you're going to roast in hell for all eternity. And therefore it's dangerous to, to, to suggest otherwise. But again, that's a big if, that's a huge if. So that's why it's it would be great to have a conversation to say, I mean, I get why you're scared and nervous of that anybody would question or doubt your your theology and your view about God, but um, that's what makes these progressive Christians progressive Christians. They have thought through and processed through those things that you think are true about God and have come out the other side and said, you know what? I don't think God is wrathful. I don't yeah. think that hell is some eternal torment, you know, torture chamber. Um, and I have good reasons for believing that. So now that's the conversation that's worth having because if you could determine that God wasn't like that, then there's no need to believe those things that Alyssa Childers and others believe about God. And there's no need to have any kind of fear or any sense of danger, right? Or any of those things because, hey, good news, everybody. God isn't that way. And this isn't what God is going to do to people that don't, don't you know, line up with this theology. Yeah, she gets right to it. It's all about fear. If you yes. don't, if you don't, it's dangerous because if you get it wrong, there are eternal consequences. And, and then she, she, kind of puts that as the the historic Christianity and it just raises the question like well where in acts are they I mean if you want to go true his, history of like yeah. the church like going back to the very foundings of the church and I don't I don't think it's 100% accurate right um but she it's, does it's, though but she, she does, does though and and it's okay let's talk let's call it historic Christianity the book of the acts yes and there's no they don't teach hell in that in right. that book they That's don't right. teach Gehenna Nope. So and and the earliest Christians, a lot of them were universalists. Yep. The earliest Christians, they would 
they would give you the Didache. Yep. And you would take like three to five years to figure out if you want you want to try Christianity on. Why? Not not because you're going to roast in hell, brother. If you don't, right. but because it's really, really fucking difficult to love your enemy. <laughs> right. And that is not just something you go like, I want to be a Christian. Oh, you might get fed to lions. Let's that, see if this is for you. That's exactly right. Dude, thank you so much for saying that. That is exactly right. Because you're right. That's, if we're going to talk about, Alyssa keeps using like that word. That's that's one of my my trigger words from Alyssa, historic Christianity. Like, you know, hey, Alyssa, historic Christianity did not begin in the 1500s with John Calvin. So you, like you said, let's go back to real- No, it began in the 5th century with Augustine. Oh, let's I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, let's the 5th century. Right. Yes, Augustine. Um, yeah, let's go back to truly historic Christianity. It's that book sitting right there on your table, the book of Acts. And as you said, there's like nine evangelistic sermons preached by the apostles themselves, and not one of those sermons includes any sort of a shotgun wedding threat that you would better follow Jesus or you're going to roast in hell forever. There's no threat of hell. In fact, one of my favorite things to point out about, again, historic Christianity, one of my favorite um, evangelistic sermons uh, preached in the book of Acts by Paul is when he stands up and speaks to idol-worshiping pagans. These are pagans who worship Pan and Zeus and um, you know uh, Aphrodite and all these uh, all these pagan gods. And he tells them, oh, things that I, that Alyssa would never feel comfortable telling non-believers. He tells them, number one, God is your father. You are his children. God loves you. God blesses you because God loves you and wants you to turn, turn and know this God. And by the way, this is the God that you live and move and have your being in already. Like you yeah. are already, you know, immersed in this God and in the, in this God and God is in you. So, I mean, that's historic Christianity. That's historic uh, theology. Why yeah. is that not acceptable? Well, and let me see if I can get the correct verse, but I think it's Acts 3, is it 321, where the theory of apocatastasis, the, that, that word is used. And if yeah. you want to get real historic, they were teaching the restitution of all things. That's what the word means. Yeah. And so there's no, when you think of apocatastasis, you don't think of, oh, we got eternal consequences here if we don't get it right. Right. No, we're talking about the restitution of all things, saying it so confidently that it's going to come about. It's as if it already has come about. That's how That's confident right. some of the early Christians are. They were not saying turn or burn. They were not saying you got to get all these things right about Jesus. Yep. There were, yo, in the early church, there were so many Jesus traditions. None of the groups could have gotten it right because let's talk logic here. If things are like contradictory, they both can't be right. And so lots of early Christians were Jesus followers and didn't agree theologically, doctrinally. Right. Especially, yeah. And especially on this doctrine of hell, by the way, because that's what's also really fascinating is because for the first like 400, 500 years of church history, um, Christians were of different minds and opinions yeah. on this doctrine of hell. And one of the ways you can tell that that is true is that when you look at the earliest creeds, the earliest creeds, which again, these creeds were talking about creedal Christianity, right? The earliest creeds, which were meant to be like, okay, what can we all as followers of Jesus agree on? What are the doctrines we do agree on? Because there are things we don't agree on. And so when they wrote down the things they do agree on, hell, eternal torment is not in the creed. Why? Because they didn't all agree on that thing. And they were okay if some of them believed eternal torment or some of them believed uh, conditional immortality or some of them, and by the way, the majority of, the, of them at the, for the first 400 years embraced universal reconciliation. And they were okay with that. It was all right to call yourself a follower of Jesus and have a different view on the ultimate you know, end of someone after they died without Christ, without faith in Christ. And so that's why they didn't include it in the earliest creeds. Hmm. So again, it, it, this was something where this wasn't Again, in historic Christianity, this question of whether or not God was going to uh, torture people for eternity or not, or destroy them uh, or not, wasn't something that was worth, you know, dividing over to the point of saying, oh, you're not a real Christian. I did a, it's probably been six or seven years now, kind of a little survey on the creeds and the development of the creeds and how they changed. So you go from the earliest Greek version of the Apostles' Creed to the Nicene Creed to, the, I think, the Athanasian Creed. And I noticed a trend of getting more and more punitive. Uh-huh. 
That's right. More and yeah, more and more fear based. There was in, in the Apostles' Creed. There's no mention of of hell, no. punishment, nothing like that. You get to later creeds, and it's like hellfire forever, everlasting. You know, it's yeah. like wow. <laughs> there is no matter what, no matter whether they could be right, they could be right in the later creeds and have and developed it. But let's just admit that it's a development of thought. It's a progression, a progression yep. of historic Christianity. Not what Elisa calls historic Christianity, but truly historic Christianity and how diverse it was to getting more and more. Now, I mean, go all the way. It's not a creed, but it's the Westminster Confession of Faith. You know how long that motherfucker is? <laughs> it take you all damn day to read. That's right. completely different than the Apostles' Creed. So it develops and develops and develops. And, you know, I think, I think, I think, I don't know this for sure, but when she talks about historic Christianity, like you said, she's going, going back 500 years or so. Yep. That's exactly right. And that's, that is uh, my beef. That's what and, Protestants tend to do. <laughs> right. And so again, I would be, f- that's fine with me. You know what I mean? Fine. I, it's, it's, it would be okay with me if Alyssa were to say, if she would use those phrases and say, this is going back to the, the theology of Augustine or Calvin. And, and if she's saying like, I value uh, Augustine's contribution to Christianity, I value and follow Calvin and Luther and all that, then great. Just say that, but stop saying historic Christianity as if, yeah. because you're planning the idea in people's minds that what you're talking about is the apostle Paul, that these are that right. the things I believe are things that were handed to us by the apostles because they're not. Yeah. It's totally reductive to say historic Christianity when talking about theology. Yes. Especially the, the, the brand of theology that she has that you and I can totally. demonstrate historically developed over a long period of time. Totally. All right. Moving on. But if we just say God is a mystery to be explored, well, this gives everyone permission to sort of create a view of God that lines up with their own personal thoughts and feelings and preferences. So if I just think, oh, God is this mystery, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just listen to what he does in my heart and what he says, well, how do I know if it's not just my own mind saying those things? Or, or if I think something is good and true and I'm just assigning that to God, but maybe God doesn't think that thing that I think is good and true is good and true. And so the danger of this is that we can end up constructing a God in our own image. And that is actually an idol. That, that's not the real God. And so we do have the Bible to tell us, to reveal the nature and the character of God to us. Certainly, there are things about God that will always be mysterious. Absolutely. I'm not saying there's no mystery, but there are things the Bible reveals to us that are quite clear about who God is, uh, what he loves, what he hates, uh, attributes about who he is. And so um, I think that's why it's dangerous to just declare that he's a mystery because you can kind of create a God in your own image. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the straw man has entered the building. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, it has. This is the and thing that she said, I don't want to do. And then she just totally read into that statement stuff that is not there. Well, let's say more on that. Okay. So I wrote down this, what she was saying. So when she says, you know, again, what, she, what concerns her is when you say God is a mystery, well, that gives everyone permission to create their own personal version of God. What? How do you get, how does it, how do those two things happen? If I say to you, this is a mystery, what I'm saying is it cannot be fully known. I'm not saying, so therefore, since no one can know what it is, make up your own version. And no progressive church would ever endorse that. They wouldn't say, hey, everybody, since nobody really knows everything about God, you can just believe whatever you want about God. It's a free for all. It's just a free, (laughs) Ali, Ali, Ox, a free, everybody. There you go. Yeah, I, I I believe Jesus is a long-haired singer for Leonard Skinner, and I'm in the front row and I'm hammer drunk, right? Yeah. Or I believe in eight-pound baby Jesus, whatever. Like, and that's not progressive Christianity. Either baby Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh-uh. there. This is a kind of a frustrating one because, in some way, and I'll give her the benefit of the doubt to say that she's correct in that it can be difficult to discern the difference between your voice, the voices in your head, and what God is speaking to you. However, no one, no one gets away from that. No. 
you know, you got these Christians who say God wanted me to drown my kids. That was from God. And then they do. And right. it's obvious that it's not from God. Well, how do we know it's obvious that it's not from God? Well, right. she she says, well, the Bible is pretty clear on it. And that's where it comes down to. I, I made a statement years ago how all of this talk comes down to, if we break it down for the most part, 99.5% of the time, the Bible. Yep. How people yep. view the Bible, what they think of the Bible. And if you think that it's clear, I just, I I know she reads it, but does she really? No. Are we reading the same Bible? There's there are so many arguments in the Bible, so many theological contradictions. And like, we know that those are there because it's like, this is an obvious debate about God. Paul yeah. and Peter in the Jerusalem church, yeah. Old Testament prophets, various Genesis uh, creation narratives that aren't yeah. the same and they're different and they're the, the gospels all four are different yeah, when did jesus them. become christ <laughs> there's four it's versions like, of the story yeah uh, if it's clear to you i don't know how we can have a conversation right and and again talk about straw man right this statement the bible reveals to us who god is and what god loves and what god does hates. it though well but i would i would say okay if you think it does, then let's have that conversation. Like I okay. would love to have that conversation, have conversation with Alyssa and say, okay, Alyssa, does the Bible show us what God is like? And I would say, well, you're, you're right, Matt, that I know she could say, well, they'll, they'll, here's Jeremiah and Isaiah. God is wrathful. God is angry. Uh, so that's what she would do. She would say, well, the, the Bible says, and then she would yeah. quote these, these Old Testament passages of God being wrathful and angry and jealous and all these things. But what I would do, and again, this is why there are different perspectives. I would say, well, Jesus says, if you want to know what God is like, look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? The Gospel of John says, no man has ever seen God at any time. That includes Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all those other guys. No one has ever seen God at any time. Right in chapter one of the, of the Gospel of John. No one has ever seen God at any time except for the Son. And he came to reveal, to make the Father known to us. Meaning, we didn't know this God until Jesus. Jesus is coming to clarify, to further give more insight into the, the nature and character of God. And I think this is also why Paul, again, are, are we following the Old Testament or the New Testament? This is why Paul says, um, he says, to this day, whenever the Old Testament scriptures are read, a veil covers our eyes because only in Christ is that veil removed. So I think there's so many reasons for us to say, okay, if we want to, go, if we want to turn to the Bible to figure out, uh, to have the Bible, quote unquote, reveal to us who God is and what God is like, you can't ignore Jesus. And if you're a Christian, especially, you can't say, I'm not going to pay attention to what Jesus comes to say and shows us what God is like, because that's what he's telling us he's there to do. And so I think if we look at Christ, what we see, if we look at Jesus, we see a version of God that is not wrathful, not angry, not retributive, um, you know, who says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, who gave, he gave, gave us this beautiful prodigal son parable about a father who instantly forgives without any wrath or anger or not even a, I told you so to his son who returns. And so, I don't know, for me, if you're going to play that card and say, well, the Bible reveals to us what God is like, I would, well, yes, let's have that conversation, please. Let's talk about that, Alyssa. What does it really say about who God is and what God is like? Because again, this is why for 400 years, the early church embraced universal reconciliation or apocatastasis, as you said, because of Jesus, because of what Paul says, right? Because of there's so there's 76 freaking scriptures about how, uh, you know, it, it, 76 scriptures that, that in, the, in, this, in the Bible that uh, support this idea of universal reconciliation. So, this is absolutely worth having a conversation about. Now, I agree the Bible is not of is not quote unquote clear because there are dissenting voices. That is part of what the Bible is. It's a collection of dissenting voices. But I just kind of thought that Jesus was the decider, that Jesus is the one that we're following, and Jesus is sort of clarifying for us again who what God is like, who God is, and uh, answers that question. So that's that's how I would respond to that. Yeah. And I would I would even go so far as to say that throughout all those dissenting voices that we mention, there is a trajectory toward Jesus. So yeah. I don't even think of it as like the Old Testament, New Testament. It's like um, it's like a roller coaster building and building and building until you yes. you know until you get to the apex, and then 
and then revealed in Christ and making everything kind of make sense. Yeah. And so that's why I can't I can't approach the Bible like Elisa does. I don't have to make things fit. There are different quote unquote voices. There's yeah. Um, but if you step back and see the broader picture, like the meta narrative, it it does become clearer. I wouldn't yeah. say it's crystal clear, but it becomes clearer that the the Hebrew story is a trajectory towards something. Yes. So that's why I don't allow proof texting on my Facebook page because I just <laughs> respond with that's a Bible verse. I don't like, so, I mean, I don't have to make, what do you do about this verse? What do you do about that? I, I, sometimes I don't do anything with it. Right. Sometimes it's one guy's opinion. Even Paul says that. This is just my opinion. Yes. And then writes it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I say not the, yeah. not, not yeah. the spirit. Yes, exactly. Speaking for myself here. So how many, it kind of like raises the question for me, how many writers of the Bible knew that, but didn't say it? And right. we're taking it as the word of God. And it could have just been like, well, this is going to be my opinion here. Yeah. No, you're right. It totally does come down to the way we approach the Bible. And again, Alyssa would, would, if Alyssa was doing a uh, a uh, response video to this podcast, uh, she would she would pause here and say, "Well, see right here, this is the difference between progressives uh, and people who quote unquote follow historic Christianity, as as Alyssa calls it." Is um you know she looks at the Bible as it's it's all the Word of God, yeah. and uh, you know uh, again it's this flat Bible perspective, yeah, um, but which isn't it, which isn't historic. No, it like isn't. The, I, from what I understand, and it's been a while since I studied these things, like the theology of the Church of Alexandria had a very allegorical method of approaching the scriptures. Yeah. And most of the early church fathers did. In fact, you know, yeah. this is Origen, the, uh, ha, ha, Origins especially, right? Yes. And I think it's, um, is it is it Origen or Tertullian? One of those guys, one of those early church fathers, uh, might have been Tertullian, but like that was their that was their critique of Marcion. You know, the first heretic, yeah. they said, you know, because he rejected the Old Testament God as being a demon or whatever. Um, and they said his mistake was not that he noticed uh, a discrepancy between the way Jesus talked about God and the way the Old Testament God l- looked. It wasn't that because they they acknowledged it, too. Yeah. Um, but they dealt with it a different way. They dealt There's with it. Conclusion. in conclusion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But what they what they said, his his Martian's mistake was was that he quote he, specifically it says that he read it literally mm. and like that's the same mistake Alyssa and others are making yeah. on the evangelical side they're reading it so literally right um, and it's and why it, it, it's why it creates such an easy atheistic critique of the bible yeah. and it's it's also why i get annoyed by so many atheists it's like you, you, yes. this is silly like i mean your your exegesis is something i've poo pooed away a long time ago Right. No, and that's exactly right. I think you and I have even talked about that. Like it's it's this really odd thing when you I, I've been on a couple of atheist shows. I think you have too. Yeah. Um, when you're on an atheist podcast and they're interviewing you and they're going, well, What about this scripture? What about that scripture? And you're trying to show them, Well, care. no, look, actually, you sound like John MacArthur. Why am I arguing? You don't even <laughs> right. like you're you're as much of a fundamentalist as these guys that you yeah. say that you disagree with. Like I disagree yeah. with them too, but it's because they're reading the Bible this this literal way, which is and, really a, it's a modern way of approaching the Bible, right? For the most part, like most Christians throughout history have not approached it like like fundamentalists do today. Yes, most uh, some have, but most. Yeah. yep, that's exactly right. So it is it is a it's not historic Christianity. It's a very modern. Well, you wrote you wrote an article about how basically that really people like her are the progressives. Yes, yes, not, not politically, but you know. Spiritually, no, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I said, you know, I, I did it sort of a, as a satire, like yeah. the dangers of progressive Christianity. And But when you click on the article and read it, yeah, I'm pointing out like these quote unquote new theologies that crept up, you know, after the apostles yeah. into the church and these these dangerous theologies that crept in like eternal torment or, um, you know, John Calvin's penal substitutionary atonement theory or uh, in the 1500s or... Uh, John Nelson Darby's dispensational end times rapture yeah. theology that crept in in the 1830s. Like these are progressive views because they came much, much later. Yeah. Um, going back before we move on to the next bit, 10 seconds here. Um, if she wants to talk about the dangers of theology, heaven and hell is conjecture. The afterlife is, is we, we haven't, we, we have no recollection of it, right? If we've been there, if we're yeah. going there, what has historically, and this is an, an historic fact, 
is the doctrine of eternal torment has been used to justify burning people at the stake and killing heretics because, quote, you kill the soul when you lead someone to perdition. We're only killing the body. And I think that was Thomas Aquinas, or it could have been Augustine. Yeah. But I think it was Thomas Aquinas has said something like that, I believe. Um, apologies to all our, all our Thomist philosophers listening. Yes, yes. Um, but that is horrific. Like, people have been killed for preaching, quote unquote, wrong belief yep. by people who use hell as a justification. That's historic fact. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing, too, again, which... I would be really surprised if uh, if Alyssa or Sean McDowell or some of these other Mike Winger or these other guys um, would ever address those things because you could address those things and say, well, yeah, those are bad and people use this theology that I believe to to justify some really horrible things. So don't do that. But it's like, but do you understand that thinking that way automatically leads you to those conclusions? Like, it, it, it's not an accident. It's like, this no, is, this it's is the way you, idea. yeah, it, it it impacts the way you live and. And this is why I've always said, like, when this on this um, topic of eternal torment or, or any of the views of hell, like eternal torment, uh, conditional immortality, um, or universal reconciliation, it boils down to not just what you believe about what happens after we die. You're also making a statement about the character and nature of God. You either believe that God is by nature a torturer, or God is a destroyer, or you believe that God is a loving Father who restores His children. Um, and transforms them. Like that is what you're saying. You, you, you ultimately like it or not, you are making a statement about God and the nature of God, but depending on which of those three views you embrace. Moving on. Is this uh clip number four? We're getting through it. We're All trudging right. along. We got two more. Wait, this one and one more, right? If uh, I'm no mathematician, but <laughs> there's five, right? <laughs> the second one is life is a gift to be enjoyed. Um, I agree on a certain level, of course, but the fundamental difference between progressive Christians and historic Christians is that, and, and we'll see this because we'll get to this in the fourth point, in progressive Christianity, um, there's really no sense of sin separating us from God. And so uh, pr uh, historically, Christians would say, yes, life, the, the truest enjoyment we'll ever know, the deepest joy, the most authentic happiness that can possibly be had is had when we are in right relationship with God. So when we put saving faith in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ and his atoning and saving work on the cross, then we enter into this relationship with God where we are reconciled to a holy God. And that is when we really find our purpose. That, and of course, we know our purpose is to love God, to know God, to worship him and be with him forever. And that can only happen when that relationship is restored. Uh, so, so I think that that is a bit, remember we talked about linguistic theft where words kind of mean different things. I think there's a little bit of that going on there, but that's how, what I would have to say about that one. Okay. Wow. Well, I don't know. I, I guess, again, I would agree with her um, that a lot of progressive Christians, maybe just speaking for myself, uh, yeah, you're right. I don't believe that our sins separate us from God, but big shock, Alyssa. I believe that because I don't think the Bible says that that's true. I mean, I know she would think it does, and that's, again, why I would love to have a conversation with her uh, about this topic, because when I have gone to look at those scriptures that's that I was told and I even taught when I was an evangelical uh, Southern Baptist minister uh, and teacher, I would um, I would turn to these things, you know, God, our sins have separated us from God and all that. But if you go and read those passages and keep on reading, you'll actually see later on in those same passages that God actually says that um, we're not separated from God, that God does look upon us. God, God doesn't look away. God isn't, God isn't, um, uh, you know, offended or to the point of like, he can't be in our presence and he won't look at us and we can't, you know, we can't have a relationship with God. Uh, so yeah, I would say, number one, I'm not, I don't agree that our sins, quote unquote, separate us from God. And I would say, again, from a New Testament perspective, um, the good news, like I love that, I quote this verse all the time. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, this is what Paul says about this idea of sin separating us from God. He says, for God was in Christ 
not counting our sins against us, but reconciling the world to himself. And that's just one verse. There's, if we wanted to, we could do a whole episode on this about all these different scriptures that affirm in the New Testament this idea that what Jesus does with sin is forgive it automatically, all the time, every time. Jesus is constantly forgiving people's sins. And by the way, when he does this, it's always before the cross, never after the cross. That makes no sense. And I don't think there's an example of anybody who actually came to Jesus and repented and confessed their sin, and then he forgave them. He just forgives them. They're walking up to him and he goes, your sins are forgiven. What do you want? And then he then he'll heal them or whatever whatever it is they want you know, have done. So, you know, the consistent thing I see when I look at this question of sin in the New Testament is God's response to sin. He's forgiven it. He's forgotten it. First Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. So as far as God is concerned, I would say from a scriptural perspective, God is not um, hung up on our sinfulness. God doesn't look at us as sinners. That's not the way God relates to us. So our sin isn't something that separates us from God. God doesn't count them. He doesn't remember them. Um, that's not uh, the front of his mind when he when God relates to us. I, I love all that. And it's proof that what Elisa is doing is kind of become, is being way over is, is straw manning progressive Christianity and being way too reductive because I would have a different take though. I would agree with, I think everything you said, Yeah, just my take, my approach to it would be different. And I would like channel my inner Derrida and say, <laughs> what do we mean by sin? And what do we mean by separation? Because I will say sin does sin, depending on how we de- define it does separate us from God experientially. Okay. It doesn't, sure. it doesn't mean there's a metaphysical separation, but it's from and, our and, side, but it's from our side. Like, yeah, yeah if, if I'm, living in sin, which is not experiencing the shalom of God. Um, I think that's uh, Platinga who talked about it in that way. And Rob Bell talks about it in that way as well. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, when we're not living in that manner, when we're harming each other, when we're not showing love, which our boy Derek Day defines as compassion and empathy, and I love that. Yes. When we don't have compassion and empathy for others, we are separating ourselves from experiencing God. That's right. And if God is an experience of, you know, consciousness being in bliss, we're not living in that blissful place where God resides. Right. So now you can agree, you can agree to, or disagree with you, Keith. You can agree or disagree with me. Yeah. The point being is Elisa said she didn't want to straw man progressives. And we just put out <laughs> two ways of understanding what she just said. Not contradictory ways, just different approaches to this question. Yes. And coming up with two different approaches. So you cannot say what progressives believe. Right. And what I would love is if Alyssa would respond to one or both of the two perspectives you and I just gave, because she, rather than respond to actual responses from actual, what she would call progressive Christians on this question of sin, she straw mans. She sets up a right. version of, uh, of right. sin, a, a perspective on this issue of sin and straw mans that, yeah. but we're not, neither one of you and I are not saying what she's saying. We're saying, both of us are saying something radically different, which that's the conversation I wish we could have yeah. about what, what I said. And I totally agree with you, Matt. I, I think actually that if you're going to think of this idea of our sin separating us from God, I completely agree with you. In other words, if I am living in a way that is harming other people, that I'm very self-centered, I don't give a crap about anybody else but myself, I'm abusing and exploiting people, that would be sinful. Mm-hmm. And when I'm doing that, I am far away from the heart and character of Christ or of God. Oh, and so, yeah. yes, but but again, from God's perspective, God would look at me and say, "Man, Keith, you are you're blowing it. What are you doing?" Yeah. Right? But God still looks at me. God can still see me. My sin doesn't prevent God from knowing me, talking to me, relating to me, reaching out to me. You know, calling me back to repentance, calling me to to uh, to live a better way, to love a better way, like. The way she understands the separation from God, it's rejection, yeah. right? It's God is pushing you away and throwing you into this giant, you know, lake of fire. It's just, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. <laughs> it's, um, it's this, it's this idea that, I don't know, anytime someone like leads off something, 
with oh I'm not going to straw man him. It's like it's like a huge red flag for me. Get ready know? for the straw man. Get, get ready for the straw man. <laughs> because again, you can disagree with us, but at least present the case accurately. Right. You and know, she I, thinks she is. I mean, again, she. Well, but how can you? We just we just debunked that. Like we just presented a literally a different case. Now you right. don't have to agree with me, but I presented the case differently, and so did you. Right. And it's it's like it's like when people say, "Oh, my cert, my train of thought came circling back." Thank thank Jesus. <laughs> um, it's like when people say, "Oh, you you diminish sin." It's like no, we just we don't elevate it above grace. That's right. all we're saying. Thank you. We're, we we take a lot of us take sin seriously. Yeah. We're just saying. Like Paul would say, how much more the gift of Christ? How much more? He does. He uses that language in Romans, I believe. Yeah, how, and, and, a, and in Corinthians, yeah. how much more the grace of God? And that's a great question. I would love to ask them that question. So, how much more? Let me know. What What do you think? How much a, more? A negative number. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we we are approaching an hour. We got one more clip. Let's do it. Let's, let's knock let's this out. Do it. Yeah. Land the plane here. Crash land. Number three. Uh, love is a responsibility to be shared. Um, agree on face value, but here's the thing. Remember, we talked about linguistic theft. Often in the progressive Christian paradigm, love means something very different than it does biblically. So biblically, we look at 1 Corinthians 13. The Bible says, of course, all the good stuff we love, The love is patient, love is kind, all of that good stuff. But it also says, love cannot rejoice in wrongdoing. And it says, love rejoices in the truth. And sometimes truth is hard. Sometimes we have to tell each other hard things. Um, we have to speak to each other uh, to, to help us be accountable to each other, to walk in this life and become more and more conformed to the image of Christ every day. But in the progressive paradigm, love is redefined to mean a celebration and affirmation of whatever someone else thinks is good and true, no matter what that may be. So we accept that, we, we affirm that, um, even if it's something that the Bible reveals is, is something that God says, no, you, this isn't okay, this isn't this is a sin. And so in the progressive world, that love word gets redefined. And so that's a responsibility that we all share. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, oh, fuck that. Um, she goes on, I think, to conclude the video. That's all we have because that was like the nugget. I think she recaps some things later. But yep. wow, like this is where this is why I made that comment on, on YouTube. Like, Alisa, I'm not going to straw man proceeds this is the biggest one this like, is the, she saved the best for last <laughs> oh my goodness like no no one is saying that no no progressives believe and then she proceeds to tell you what progressives believe and i'm like what like, I what don't, i don't where are that. you getting yeah. this like prove that where's the quote to prove that that thing about how it just gets love gets redefined as to whatever anybody wants, whatever, no whatever matter what it is. you think is good, no matter what it is. Yeah, I think murdering is good. Okay, well, I love you by just I accepting you. you. Yeah, I just like, accept you. That's great. I like torturing puppies. Well, I think that's great. I think that's If you wonderful. love it, man, just <laughs> lean into it. Keep on torturing puppies. I, that's great. Hallelujah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> but, okay. no, no one is saying that. No one. Okay, but I think there is a there is an underlying... Uh, unspoken um, thing here that she is talking about without talking about, which uh, I, I think if you were to, if we could talk to her again, which we can't, but if we were to drill down, like, okay, what, what are some specific examples, Alyssa, in your mind that you would, could, you could give us where progressive Christians define something as quote unquote love that the Bible is clear, isn't love and is actually a sinful lifestyle. I'm pretty sure she would point to homosexuality. I think, yes, that's exactly what she, that's the, that's what she's not talking about. Yeah. She's saying it without saying it. Right. Yeah. And again, once again, the problem is the Bible. And she even says that the, what the, the biblical view, right. The biblical view of love, definition of love. Yeah. Right. Or marriage or things like or that. Marriage, like, okay, yeah. okay. Th this is Sex. what she's not saying, which again, I would so love to have this conversation with her and say, well, help me understand, like, again, this is one of those things where, and I think in the article I wrote about progressive Christianity, about how the word homosexual never appeared in any English translation of the Bible until 1946. And what they did was take two different Greek words, 
Senakotai and Malakoi, and translated them as homosexuality. But neither one of those words mean homosexuality. And that's a progressive thing. That was a radical change. There's no reason to do that other than you have an agenda of wanting to just shove that in to that passage. But but the fact that it happened, the fact that the word homosexual is in her English translation of the Bible that she's reading from, is one of the main reasons that she believes that it's, quote unquote, the biblical view that homosexuality mm-hmm. is a sin. Yeah, let's have that conversation, please, because that's worth having. Yeah, and let's have let's have an honest adult conversation about it. Because I would even agree that, like, I don't use the word homosexuality. I, I don't. I don't think it's the right way to even approach it. Like, if she wants to say homosexuality is a sin, yeah, but homosexuality itself carries with it a medical diagnosis. That's yes. what. That's the, so. Even today, we've moved on from that to like. Like a loving gay couple, I wouldn't call them homosexual because it's almost a pejorative. Right. And so there's nothing in the Bible that condemns that. The Bible condemns sexual exploitation, gay, straight, or otherwise. Right. And that's what all of those... I mean, if you want to say, I'm Malakois because I shave my face. I would that's look right. effeminate in the... In, you have a nice beard. You're looking good. You're you're straight. Like I'm covered. You're, I'm going to make it. You're covered. <laughs> yeah, literally and figuratively. Yes. I would have the problem. and and. So would anyone who cuts the side of their hair. So does anyone that. Yep. Any woman that wears pants, any man that's right. Face. Uh, it's. Uh, I would be soft and effeminate because I, I shave. I, I right. don't have any facial hair. Right. And that is literally what that word. Malakoi that's literally means. what Malakoi means. So yes. to say, oh, well, that that's what we're talking about when we talk about LGBTQ or gay, straight, whatever. It's like, wow, this is. This is go learn what this means. Anachronism, Elisa. That's go right. learn what an anachronism means. Because I would agree that the Bible is pretty clear that a, a, an older man should not coercively fuck a boy. That's right. I would agree with, with Romans. That's our Senate That's our I, Senate I, I would agree with that. I would agree yeah. with Le- Leviticus that an uncle and a nephew should not have sex. That's, That's probably right. <laughs> I'm probably pretty good there. However, right. Right. If you don't want a straw man. Let's not straw man what a what a, a gay loving couple is doing in their right. home. Let's say, right. you know, so come on. Yeah, and so this is the thing too. Like again, let's let's talk about truly <clears throat> historic Christianity, um, and uh, you know, the the Christian Church very recently um, had a very hard time with this biblical concept of slavery because the Bible does not condemn owning some another person as property. And so uh, I even included that in my book. I think it was in um, Jesus Unbound because I was talking about the Bible. And I actually did a little thing where I took a quote from a, uh, a Christian you know, author, a pastor, teacher d- dude, who was uh, making this really strong statement uh, about slavery and saying that anybody that spoke against slavery was speaking against the word of God because the Bible you know, does not condemn slavery. And to condemn slavery is to contradict the, the word of God. Mm. and um, of course, this was during uh, you know the Civil War era, yeah. and so what I did was I took that quote and I just I it took out the word slave and I put in the word homosexual or or LGBTQ, LGBTQ, and when you read it, you're like, wow, what a strong statement. But then when you realize, well, actually, the original quote was about slavery. <laughs> now you can see what I'm saying, you clever bastard. <laughs> like it's, it's the same. It's the same thing Alyssa is doing, and other people, other Christians are doing, and I I feel like I, I have this hope. That fast forward 50 years, hopefully not more than that, but maybe 100 years from now, Christians are going to finally turn the corner on the homosexual scriptures, you know, the the scriptures that they believe uh, condemn homosexuality the same way they eventually turn the corner on slavery. And they're going to say, well, because now, you know, they would be like, oh, no, the Bible doesn't do that. Oh, no, no, no. They, no, no, none of those guys would say, "Oh, the Bible absolutely thinks slavery is great." Mm-hmm. No, because what what's happened? The culture has has gone beyond that. Yeah, they get really nuanced when it comes to slavery. All of a sudden, with the Bible, <laughs> all, all of a sudden, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> they're, they're they're very capable of being nuanced yes. when it comes to slavery. Yeah. Now, this is a little but now they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but they didn't used to be able no. to do that. And it's the same kind of thought that today is these Christians that are holding again, like Marcion tightly to this literal translate the bible says okay well i get that you think the bible says but you need to move a little farther on here right, right. um to rethink what these things are really saying yeah well this has been <sighs> fun keith i i feel like um 
That hour went by pretty quick. I hope it went by quick for the listeners. I hope so too. It was fun. Yes. And uh, thank you, Alyssa Childers, for continuing yes. to put out great content for us to respond to. <laughs> I guess we'll see Our you next week. Partner. <laughs> Our unseen partner. No, we podcast. can move on to something. I, I was kicking around the idea to you, like we should probably in each of our episodes go back and forth covering the book. Because I think I've got one, two, three. Yeah, I've got seven books. You've got seven books with choir and we can go back and forth and go. talk about why we wrote them and what's in there. And There you yeah. go. Not as shameless, not as shameless be- plug, but as just like a... Kind of like yeah, a, yeah, yes, think, a book synopsis of our own shit. There you go. Actually, we could interview each other about there you go. our book, what we what we wrote and why and all yeah. that. Yeah. So until That's next great. time, thank you to our sponsor, of course, again. Thank you to Alyssa. Thank, thank you to you, Keith. And thank you to thank the you, listeners. Thank you, lovely listeners. All 10,000 of them. No, I'm, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there. Yeah, eventually. All right. Later. All right. Take care.